Hey everyone, motor oil in today's automotive world is like a religion. Everybody's got their own favorite type of oil. Everybody's got their own method of maintaining their vehicles and their intervals. And if you're ever bored, go into an automotive forum and start an oil thread. That'll keep you going for days. So I'm not here to tell you what oil to use or how to maintain your vehicle. But I recently heard that oil analysis was a thing. Who knew? You collect a sample of your old oil and send it off to a lab to be analyzed to see how the oil degraded and how many wear materials and contaminants were contained in the oil. In other words, how well did your precious oil do at protecting your engine? With synthetic oils as good as they are today, is it worth it having your oil analyzed? Is this just sheer idiocy or some form of obsessive compulsive behavior to know how your oil is performing? Well, yes and no. By the end of this video, I'll give you a case where it may make sense for you to know the numbers behind your oil. I'm going to explain my experience with oil analysis done by Blackstone Labs in Fort Wayne, Indiana. While I'm sure that there are others, this is the only firm that I'm aware of and is the one that did my oil test. Let's go through the process. First of all, go to their website at blackstone-labs.com and request a free test kit. You'll receive a free sample bottle in the mail a couple of days later in a self-addressed business reply mail envelope. You can either fill out your request online or use the included card so you pay for the test ahead of time. During your next oil change, use the sample bottle to grab a few ounces of the used oil, put your name on the sample with your customer number, wrap it all up and stuff it into their envelope and drop it off at your local post office. Now, this is where things went sideways for me. Blackstone includes a tracking number with the envelope, so I know that the local post office checked it in. It got from my local post office to Indianapolis in about a day, and then it sat there in Indianapolis for two months. I had pretty much given up after a few weeks. Apparently, this is a problem, according to the Blackstone folks. Many of them get stuck there. Blackstone was great through the entire process and kept encouraging me until the sample finally arrived at their site. They hustled the test through and emailed me my results in about 24 hours after receiving the sample. All right, so once I got my email back, what did I learn from these test results? Well, first of all, let's talk about the sample. This was Pennzoil Ultra Platinum 5W30 with 4,076 miles on it, put on over four months of time. So most of my driving is short trips around town, occasionally a longer trip. So first of all, you get a narrative. The comments at the top of the report are, to me, very valuable. These comments come from a tech that's probably looked at hundreds of test results from the same engine as yours with dozens of different types of oil. So this is almost like talking to an experienced mechanic, especially since I'm not an automotive engineer nor a metallurgist. So to break down some of these comments, first of all, the first sample from this truck looks good. Okay, that's good to hear. The oil wasn't in use and the metals are in good standing. So that is good to hear. That's what I would expect with a fairly new engine. None of them are high enough to flag, which means there's no evidence of poor wear or an internal issue in this data. Okay, that's great to hear from somebody telling me what's inside my engine based on the oil. Here's something of a little bit of concern. The viscosity is a little bit low for 5W30, reading in the 5W20 range or so. And the fuel is harmless at 1.3%. So I wonder how those are related. I would expect that if there was a bit more fuel in there, I'd have lower viscosity, but I don't know. Then they go on to say small amounts of fuel dilution are usually from normal use like idling or short trips. Since my truck is a power boost, it doesn't idle very much. Short trips, definitely. And lastly, they bring up the fact that the 4.4 TBN is strong. Lots of active additive left. We'll talk about the total base number at the end of this report. There's three basic parts to the report besides the comments. The first is wear metals. These are small trace amounts of metal and parts per million that have worn off your engine's moving parts due to the constant hammering that an engine parts experience due to normal operation. 
you want the lowest possible numbers with these. And again, these come straight from Blackstone. Aluminum. So we're gonna see aluminum. These come from the pistons, bearings, cases, heads, and blocks. Chromium, generally from rings. Iron, generally from cylinders, rotating shafts, valve train, any steel part sharing the oil. Copper, brass or bronze parts, copper bushings, bearings, oil coolers. Lead comes from bearings, leaded gas, fuel additives, tin from bearings, bronze parts, piston coating. Nickel, trace element and steel, platings on some cylinder types. And silver comes from bearings. And then finally, titanium, some intake valves and connecting rods, aftermarket parts, sometimes an oil additive. Those are the wear metals. Let's see how they looked on my results. Here's the details on my report. Let me explain this for a second here. The universal averages over on the right-hand side are for the 3.5 liter Ford EcoBoost. So all the other engines that they've tested, these are the averages for that engine. So I'm comparing my engine versus the universal averages. The unit location averages are for my engine. And so you can see the various columns here would be for any additional test that I take on this specific engine. You can see trends, you can see the numbers change with time. And so for right now with one report, I'm starting from scratch. I'm just comparing my engine versus universal averages. So let's get into the wear metals first of all. Aluminum, my number is a five versus universal average of four, which is okay, I guess that's not, not of any concern. Chromium, one versus an average of one, that's okay. Iron, 13 versus an average of 20, so that's better than average. Copper, 11, which is slightly below universal average of 13. Lead, zero, which is good. Tin, one, which is slightly above universal average of zero. Maybe that's because this is a brand new engine. Next one, a little further down, is nickel. And nickel comes in at one, universal average of zero. Again, hardly anything on a parts per million basis. Silver, also zero. And then finally, titanium is a one with a universal average of two. So I think you can see that these numbers are right around the universal average. They're not elevated in any manner. Sometimes they're slightly better than universal average. Again, this is a first sample and I can trend with this. The next part of the report is contaminants. These are elements that should not be in your oil. These will typically not be absolute zero, but again, you want the lowest possible numbers with these. These are potassium, which generally comes from antifreeze and sometimes is an additive in oil types. Sodium, antifreeze, ethylene glycol, additive in some gasoline engine oils, or if you've got this in a marine engine, you might be getting some seawater. And then silicon, airborne dirt escaping air filtration, sealers, gaskets, sand casted parts, spray lubricants, antifreeze inhibitor, oil additive. So these are again, are things that you do not want in your oil. Let's see how these ranked up in my report. Okay, the first contaminant is potassium. And for a universal average of three, I get zero. That's good. The second one is sodium for universal average of 17, I got four. Again, good number. Next one for contaminants is silicon. And for a universal average of 19, I come in right in the average of 19. So these are good numbers. Now these, uh, the third section is additives. These are additive packages to the oil that help disperse soot and combustion byproducts, detergents, and anti-wear elements. These are the differentiating elements added to the base oil and can make a big difference in the oil's ability to provide extended service life, offer better wear resistance to friction. These are generally things that have come along in the last 30 years or so when you compare today's oil versus that of a few decades ago. The additives are much, much stronger these days. What we're gonna look for in the report is molybdenum, anti-wear additives, some types of rings. Manganese is a trace element additive in some gasoline. Boron, detergent dispersant additive, antifreeze inhibitors. Calcium, detergent or dispersant additive. Magnesium, detergent dispersant additive. 
Again, these are good things that we want to see in the oil. Phosphorus, anti-wear additive, zinc, anti-wear, barium, detergent, dispersant, additive used in some synthetics. So let's see how these turned out in my report. First up on the additives is molybdenum. Universal average 87, I came in at 81, slightly below average. Number two is manganese. Universal average of four, I came in at two, slightly below average. Number three is boron. Universal average of 44, I came in well above that at 147. Next one is calcium. Universal average of 1401, I came in at 1082, slightly below average. Next one is magnesium. Universal average of 487, well above that at 729. Phosphorus is the next one. Universal average of 672 came in almost on the button at 667. Next one is zinc. Universal average 763 came in at 740. And lastly, barium. Universal average of 2 came in at 0. And lastly, we get to the physical properties. These are another set of data points to show whether or not you have something happening in your engine that shouldn't be happening, such as fuel or coolant or water in the oil. So these will be measured through viscosity flash point. If you're present in the oil, the viscosity and flash point will often be lower than stated in the value should be line. A high viscosity may show oil oxidation or high levels of soot can also show an oil additive in use if these are high. Fuel percent indicates the amount of volatile fuel dilution found in the oil. Antifreeze percent indicates the amount of antifreeze found in the oil. Question mark means that we found traces of coolant, but not enough to definitely say it's there. And then water percentage indicates the amount of water found in the oil. That's not good. <laughs> you know what happens when you get water in the oil. It looks like pudding. And then insolubles. Insolubles are solid materials present in the oil. These are typically free carbon from the oxidation of the oil itself, along with blow-by past the rings. And then finally, we get the total base number. TBN, or total base number, measures how much base, as in base versus acid, additive is in the oil to offset the effects of acids. So the byproduct of combustion is acid, Oil needs to have base in it to balance that out. The TBN will start reading in the 6.0 to 14 range. And when you first start using the oil, the TBN tends to drop sharply. Then it levels out and drops more slowly after that. The lower the TBN reading, the less active additive the oil has left. A low TBN test result, meaning very little additive is left, is down around 1.0. So let's see how my report showed physical properties of my oil. First off, the first three rows speak to viscosity and flash point, and all of these are slightly lower than the values should be. And so this is why in my general comments, they mentioned that the viscosity was a little bit low. Next up is fuel percent, should be below 2%, and it came in at 1.3. Antifreeze percent. Zero, that's always good. Water percent, zero, that's great. Insolubles, should be less than 0.6, came in at 0.2, that's terrific. And then finally, the TBN or total base number is 4.4. So you can see that there is somewhere, it's not brand new like it would be if it was say eight to 16 or so, it's actually come down from there, but it's still well above 1.0. So the total base number is still quite effective after 4,000 miles. Okay, let's wrap it up. What was the bottom line from my testing and what are my recommendations? What would I recommend that people do when it comes to oil analysis? The oil performed as expected after 4,000 miles and I'm sure that I could have run it a lot longer without damaging the engine or affecting it in any way. So there's gonna be those of you out there going, Man, you threw away perfectly good oil. And I'm okay with that. Oil is cheap compared to engine work. So I just needed to know, right? And this is something that everybody can do. But the loss of viscosity was somewhat surprising. So my 5W30 turned into 5W20. I'm gonna chalk this all up to a lot of short trips where the engine never really gets warm 
All of this mileage was over the winter months between November and March, which are admittedly very mild in South Carolina. I still was surprised by the amount of dilution. I now have a baseline. So no more oil religion. Let the numbers dictate my decisions. Based on what I try, I now can work off of numbers. So I find this to be very, very valuable. I am going to run a different brand of oil for the next test and see how it compares. Blackstone was great through the whole thing. Everything was very quick. Once they got the, the test sample, they were really good about communications. Every time I reached out to them and said, hey, it's been two months. What do you want me to do? They were very good with it. They said, yeah, sometimes this happens and quite often it happens. So maybe next time you want to send it directly. So they were great about it and they turned it around very quickly as soon as they did get it. So they were terrific. And I really enjoy the report that they uh, they put a lot of work into the report. So I think there's a lot of value into the 35 bucks that you spend. So here's my recommendations. Let me wrap this up for you guys. If you plan on owning your vehicle for as long as possible, it's never too late to get a baseline for your engine. Even if you have 100,000 miles on it, it's worthwhile to get a baseline because you want to see where it's trending. You want to see if there's any of those elements that shouldn't be in your oil start to creep into your oil. This way you can see if anything unwanted starts to affect your oil and affect the numbers. Skip the TBN measurement unless you run a fleet, if you run a trucking service of some type, and it's important for you to extend your drains from an economic perspective. Otherwise, if you're just a normal retail consumer, skip the TBN. It is unnecessary to run a test with every oil change. I think that would be OCD and completely obsessive to do something like that. I'll probably run these about every 15,000 or so, which means for me, that's three oil changes. So every third oil change, every 15K, I'm gonna run a test and I will check for trends unless something happens before that. If you want your test back quickly, consider shipping it directly through FedEx or UPS or somebody and skip the prepaid business return mail. So if you're not in a rush, you can use it. If you'd like to get a quick turnaround on your results, then ship it directly. Well, that wraps up this video. I really learned a lot about oil and how it's measured and you know what elements are in the oil and the ones that should be and the ones that shouldn't be in the oil. And it it's kind of liberating now getting away from this whole, you know, oil religion and getting into some actual scientific data points that I can use going forward to make decisions with this. So it's really empowering. And I hope you found it useful. And maybe it's something that you can do as well yourself. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.